directly on uh, H2, H1, H2 uh, stellar mass relations. Sorry, I'm having trouble. You listen? That's okay. Thank you. Well, uh, I'm Ron Calet, and I will, I will be talking about the H1 and H2 relations, the stellar mass relation of early and late type galaxies, and the consistency of these ones with the observed galaxy mass functions. Well, first, uh, motivation. Uh, we're motivated by the fact that coal gas content information by observation is very scarce given the sensitivity uh, of current radio telescopes and its, its sky coverage. Uh, secondly, that the blind H1 service, for example, alfalfa or H1 pass, are very biased towards gas rich and blue galaxies. So inferring, for example, the H1 to stellar mass correlation is challenging. And more importantly, for H2, the H2 component, there are no blind surveys. So our aim here is, given that at the moment there are no complete and homogeneous surveys in radio, that in the future, near future, uh, facilities like SKA, the square kilometer array, will be more in line like the optical service. Uh, right now, we, we are aimed in this work to uh, compile the current information about 15 local samples with information regarding stellar mass, morphology, uh, H1, and or H2. Well, so uh, our goal here is to first determine the general trends of the H1 and H2 to stellar mass uh, relations for two populations and their moments. More, um, we're going to go uh, not only at the general level, but we want to constrain the distribution of the H1 and H2 uh, masses at, at stellar mass parity. And finally, construct volumes, complete volume samples in H1 and H2. And, and constraint and construct the, the mass functions of these components for early and late type galaxies. Well, uh, our challenges is to homogenize all this data, uh, see if there, if there are any selection bias given the selection criteria, and the treatment of, of non detections and upper limits. Well, in this slide, I'm showing you our compiled observational data. On the left side, uh, for atomic hydrogen, left side, molecular hydrogen, the top panels represents late type data. And the lower panels, early type galaxies. Um, I would like to, to say that I will show you basically the same order in the next, in the following slides. But this is basically our compiled data, the original compiled data. But we are not able to constrain uh, the H1 and H2 to stellar cor mass correlations directly from this data. So what do we need to do? First, uh, homogenize this data. In what sense? Stellar masses. Uh, there are several systematics involving the determination of the stellar mass. But the most important is the initial mass function. We set all the data stellar masses uh, to a Chabrier initial mass function. We compile all the distances and inferences for masses to a cosmology, this cosmology. And also, as we like to take into account upper limits, um, the, ter the determination of the upper limits varies depending on the, on the sample. So we perform an homogenization uh, regarding the upper limits. We see if these samples that I showed you before are biased uh, because of selection criteria like environment. And finally, we take into account something uh, that is uh, in the H2 determination. We're considering a dependent uh, um, H2 to see a conversion factor that depends on both stellar mass and gas phase metallicity. So uh, I'm, I'm showing here the homogenized data, as, as I told you before, in the same direction that in the first slide I showed you. And in gray are the detected data. And in purple, I want to stress that um, 
there, these are the upper limits that we are um, homogenizing. And as you see, all this data is um, close together in a single part of the, of the plot. And how do we take into account this um, non-detected data? Because the data has information of the gas that is not detected, but they are, those are galaxies that are in the sides of the plots. And, but we don't know how much gas are, are contained. So in order to do that, we, we rely on, on survival methods, survival non-parametric methods, basically the Kaplan-Meyer estimator and the Buckley james uh, estimator. Next one. And well, I'm going to show you the main results. The first one is I'm showing here the average uh, gas ratios to gas to stellar mass ratios. Uh, as a function of stellar mass. And uh, as you can see, we can constrain that. Uh, for example, for galaxies of 10 to the 7 in stellar mass, uh, the gas content in H1, light type galaxies, it's about four times greater than, than the stellar mass. And the opposite is, well, uh, is the opposite in, in the early types. You have uh, one, 100 times more uh, stellar mass than gas mass. It's basically the same for these two plots. And, well, I'll show you, I'm showing here the or fitted correlations. We find that the best, fitted, um, the best fit was a double power low with transition masses, more or less at two times uh, 10 to the nine, to, to the nine um, stellar masses. And as I told you before, we, we even push further with this uh, Kaplan-Meyer estimator. And we estimated how is the H1 distribution given the stellar mass. Each panel is an, an stellar mass. They are the pins. And in gray is the Kaplan-Meyer estimation, also here, for late galaxies and early type galaxies. We perform a fitting, Bayesian in, in, uh, fitting of a Schechter function for late types. And for early types, we also fitted a, a Schechter function. But we, we can see that uh, we have a lot of uh, upper limits here. This is, this, is, this is the same, basically, for, for molecular hydrogen. So how we, do, we, do we infer the mass functions? Well, we can use the stellar mass function. And these distributions of H1 and H2 at a given stellar mass in order to um, construct volume complete uh, samples of H1 and H2 and then calculate the, the mass functions. Moreover, we can. Uh, segregate these this total mass functions using the fraction of early galaxies of function of stellar mass into the late types and early type components. And, well, this is the total mass functions of uh, stars, H1 and H2. The black thick lines are our results. And for H1, we're comparing with blind surveys, and we see a very good agreement. Here, the purple line is considering uh, that the H2 inferences was made considering the usual um, conversion factor, and we are consistent with the observations that were determined the same way. Also, we segregated in, in the two late and early type components, and we see that we are very consistent with the few uh, observed inferences that there are. And we can go even further, so using this, um, the galaxy halo connection, um, specifically an abundance matching based on Bmax, which will uh, recover the two-point stellar correlation functions. We're assigning stellar masses into the Bolshoi uh, embody simulation. And then we also are assigning H1 and H2 masses based on the results I showed you before. And we can derive, for example, two-point correlation functions not only for stars, but for, for H1 and H2. Directly from this uh, method, we can compute the stellar two halo mass um, fractions and extend this to H1, H2, gas, and baryonic uh, fractions. This is only the comparison with the, this result, the stellar component, with all the, the other components inferred. And as I told you before, we can compare with um, observational inferences of the two-point correlation functions in uh, H1. And well, I would like to finish just saying that uh, the motivation of this work was uh, to give um, and body similar, I mean, hydro simulators, a tool to compare or to constrain 
to constrain these simulations. So uh, these are only two examples of, of the application of this work, and, and it's the recent work from Lagos and the, actually the Santa Cruz analytical model. Uh, so thank you very much, that's all. Any question? Yeah. Yes. This, this connection with abundance matching is really interesting. Yes. Do, you, do you know of, I mean, it, is there any reason to think that we should be doing abundance matching with stars as opposed to just all the baryons? I mean, flipping it around, I mean, what would, it, what would happen mm -hmm. had you done abundance matching with just the full baryon mass no. and then done the clustering, et cetera? No, no actually, uh, sorry, the clustering in what? Central or satellites? Or? Well, you, you showed the clustering agreed reasonably well with like the H1 clustering, for yes. example, when you did, you basically did abundance matching on stellar mass and then yes. added your H1 relation. Yes. What I'm wondering is, what would happen if you would have done abundance matching just on total baryonic okay. mass and then come back and done these kind of comparisons? Does yeah. that break things or make it better or what? No, I think that you should recover the same, but I did it in this way because uh, basically the relations are very limited in stellar mass range or uh, there, there's, it's very difficult to, to do abundance matching using, for example, H1. As I told you at the beginning, uh, H1, H1 surveys are very biased, so uh, if, if there were not th those biases, we should recover this. I mean, it's, it's only another way to, to, to constrain it, and that should be the right way, but it's, it's, it's because of the limitations of the observation, that's all. Any other question? Yeah, can you shout? There's a fraction of the molecular gas that should actually seal dark. So mm -hmm. do we need to uh, worry about that? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question, please? So uh, my question is uh -huh. the molecular gas fraction at the low mass end, do we need to worry about that? The significant fraction of the molecular gas is actually CO dark, so they, they are not traced by CO. Uh, yeah, I think we should be a little bit worried, but we're trying to take it. We're trying to push as far as we can. Actually, I didn't mention, but uh, some of the inferences were extrapolations, but uh, I would say uh, it's kind of uh, right in the right direction because we're recovering more or less what it is expected. Thanks. More questions? Okay, so let's thank Ruben again. <laughs>